I'm Tavi Nasir, and this is Leadership Biz Cafe, a podcast that provides insights and tools to help leaders take on the challenges and opportunities found in leading today's workplaces. Leadership Biz Cafe is brought to you by Tavi Nasir Leadership, our leadership firm that offers keynotes and corporate trainings in both in-person and virtual settings that will help you to improve the way you lead and guide your organization's growth and future successes. Now, if you've been enjoying my podcast and the insights and tools I've been sharing on how you can improve your leadership craft, and you're interested in having me expand on them with your team and organization, I'd like to invite you to check out my speaking page on our website at tavinasir.com to learn about some of the topics I can discuss at your upcoming event. And now, I'd like to introduce my guest for this episode, James Burstall. James is a British film and television producer and CEO of the international media group Argonon. He also served as the executive producer on several shows, including HGTV's House Hunters International, Hidden Potential, and The Masked Singer. I've invited James to speak with me about his book, The Flexible Method, Prepare to Prosper in the Next Global Crisis, which details a tried and tested approach for how leaders can prepare and lead through a crisis. Hi, James. Welcome to the Leadership Biz Cafe. Thanks for having me. So, James, the flexible method involves the key elements of putting people first, calm and purposeful leadership, flexible thinking, adaptability, and radical determination in implementing your decisions. Now, before we explore these elements of the flexible method, I'd love it if you could share how you came to develop this approach. What were the key lessons to leading your organization that helped to shape and inform this? Well, I work in the entertainment business. I'm a producer with a production group that spans UK, US, Canada, and indeed we sell to the rest of the world. Uh, We we have offices in London, Liverpool, Glasgow, New York, and Los Angeles. And we produce a whole range of programming um, from documentaries to entertainment shows, uh, to reality, to scripted drama. And I decided that I wanted to write a book because we went through the most horrendous experience like everybody else in COVID. And we had to come up with all sorts of clever ideas and plans as a team in order to survive. Of course, this came on the back of only a few years before the credit crunch, which is really when we began uh, the concept of the flexible method and we honed it in COVID. And I thought, you know what, I want to write these things down because when we went into these crises, there was no toolkit. There was no guidebook to really help uh, leaders or people who run teams across all industries. There was no um, sort of methodology. So I thought, you know what, I'm going to try and do something useful that I hope will help the next generation when the next crisis comes along. And, you know, they will come along. In fact, we live in a term in a time of perma crisis now. So hopefully now there will be a book that people can reach for across many different industries and find value in there because I wrote the book to be purposeful. I got to tell you, as I was reading your story, James, I found it fascinating and very instructive to see it happening almost in real time, how you were addressing some of the challenges. So I do hope you'll share some of those examples as we go through the flexible method that will help people really appreciate how we can help you know, pivot and adapt to changing realities brought forth by whatever crises we're facing. So getting back to the flexible method, one of the first elements that caught my interest was your idea of leading with calm purpose. Now, when we're faced with a crisis, things are anything but calm. So how do we accomplish that when the very nature of a crisis is that it upends our current reality and creates this uncertainty and tension about what do we do now? I think authenticity in leadership is now absolutely critical. We have to be real. We have to be truthful with ourselves and with our teams. uh, And we have to speak uh, authentically, uh, even when things are tough. So when we were all sent off into lockdown back in March 2020, I realized that there are a lot of people in my business spread out across the planet who were very, very frightened and who some of work were some, some of whom were in rented accommodation, maybe with poor Wi-Fi. And I felt it very important, first of all, to make sure they were safe, to make sure they were healthy, they had food on the table, that elderly parents were safe, that kids were okay, not feeling terrified, which of course we all were at the beginning. And then I started reaching out and sending daily emails to people, speaking in a very authentic but very calm way to say, you are not alone. We are here with you. 
The senior team at my group, Argonaut, and I do not have all the answers, but we are working closely with every government agency that's available to us. We are reaching out to our network and we are very calmly starting to put together a plan. And at the beginning, that plan was hour by hour, those first few days of lockdown. Then it was morning by afternoon. Then it was day by day, then week by week. And then little by little, things started to extend and expand. And it's very important when you are being a calm, purposeful leader to one, kindle hope, to make sure your people know that there is hope, and to start to set out tangible, manageable deadlines, whether it be hour by hour at the beginning and then extending outwards. And then people feel that they are on a journey. We're not pretending. This is not boosterism. And there have been examples of politicians who've used boosterism to try to pretend that everything is okay. <clears throat> when it's not okay, you immediately lose credibility. You have to be authentic and real with everybody and you have to speak the truth. But at the same time, you do not want to overshare. I do not think it is helpful for a leader to be on a screen or in a public forum sobbing their eyes out and, and you know, expressing you know, a sense of complete disaster. Now, let's be honest, we're all human. And there were times when I lost sleep and I felt seriously, extremely worried about where things were going. But I shared that with my partner or with my very closest allies who are not in the business. And then I did actually put together and what we call a COBRA team. And this is a, it's based on what the British government has in terms of in times of emergency. They put together like an emergency hit squad, if you like. And I, I put into that team five of my key players who are not yes people. These are people who tell me the hard truth, sometimes the truth I don't want to hear. And that was somebody from operations, somebody from legal, someone from commercial, someone from IT, someone um, from uh, uh, HR. And in that room, we were able to talk candidly with each other in a very contained way and say, listen, this is extremely worrying. This is an existential threat to our business. At the beginning of COVID, we were told that all production would have to stop perhaps for 12 months. Of course, if we don't produce, we have no income and we have no business. You can't pay our bills. So we were uh, very supported. And actually, I found it incredibly valuable to be able to turn to my five key people at the top of the tree who would say to me, James, you know what, this is really difficult, but we are in this together. And that was the place where we could be open uh, with each other without oversharing to the wider group. You know, there's also a point you make in this part of your book that I found particularly useful, which is that leaders need to strike that balance of communicating more to help create some clarity about what we're going to do right now, but not communicate unnecessarily where all you're doing is basically making people feel more worried or uncertain about what's to come. And you share some great advice based on your experience communicating to your team during the pandemic for how and what we should be communicating to our employees to not just allay their fears, but help give them a sense of direction and hope about where we're going to go and what we have to do differently. So when faced with a crisis, what are some of the key considerations we need to keep in mind in terms of what and how we should be communicating to our team? It's very important that you keep things simple and uh, manageable that people can understand. And in fact, in the book, because the book is broad based and it's aimed at the broadest possible audience, I did interview some incredibly inspiring leaders. And there's one in particular I'd like to cite. Uh, David Holt is the first uh, Native American uh, mayor in any uh, US city. Um, he is the mayor of Oklahoma City, and he's only 40 years old. He's a very, very impressive man. Now, his method of communicating is very simple, very contained, and very clean cut and clear. And he is a Republican, although he's not a Trump supporter. Uh, and he started out back in March 2020, when actually in the state of Oklahoma, there was a general feeling that COVID kind of probably didn't even exist or would something would probably go away. He in Oklahoma City, which is a very diverse community, felt, no, that is not right. It is my job to protect my people. And therefore, he started a process of very clean, very clear daily updates when required, not, not every single day, but when required, to start to lay out, yeah, we are going to shelter from home. We are going to shut down bars and restaurants. We are, for a period of time, going to lock down business so that there is a minimum amount of contact because I want to protect you. And you know what? The outcome of fatalities terrible way to have to measure success but the way but what actually happened in Oklahoma City is that they had very very low fatality rates 
And of course, the people of Oklahoma City felt that they were being protected, guided, kept very closely informed. And what happened shortly after COVID? He won another election by a landslide. This kind of authentic, calm, purposeful leadership works. Yeah, and I think another good point you bring up here is how the style of communicating and what we're communicating has to evolve over the span of the crisis where what we are sharing and what we're imparting at the beginning will be drastically different from what's at the middle and at the end. So could you elaborate, maybe even in your own experiences, what were the things that you saw that you had to change or pivot when you start at the start of the crisis and then as it evolved, were the things you noticed, okay, I need to focus more on communicating this message. And then at the end, what were the things you felt that you really had to draw people's attention to? Yeah, you have to be very, very flexible in your mindset. And you're absolutely right. At the beginning, it was hour by hour. When we were all sitting at home in our houses uh, in the in the middle of March 2020, thinking, my goodness, you know, this could be the end of the world, let alone the end of production, uh, it was very frightening. And we had to deal with things in very small incremental chunks. Um, the very first thing we did, as I said before, is we made sure everybody was safe. You must put your people first. Then we started to think, first of all, within the COVID team that I described, and then in a wider group, how can we possibly get back into production? Now, we were told by most of our clients, and we work for Discovery and Netflix and the BBC and amazing clients all over the world, we were told by most of them that probably getting back into production would not happen for a whole year because it was just too complicated. Now, we're an independent producer, and that DNA we have within us is, well, we're entrepreneurs waiting for a whole year with thousands of people who work for us, freelancers and some full-time employees, not being able to earn a living. That's just not an option. So I asked my legal and commercial team to start the meticulous and laborious task of putting together COVID protocols in order to enable us to get back into production. And we did that with two shows. We produced The Masked Singer, which is a big, shiny floor entertainment show on a Saturday night. And we decided that we were going to put the... Put the uh, uh, the the four celebrity uh, panel uh, into an empty studio uh, with simply cameramen and sound recordists all masked up. All of the panel would be surrounded by plastic, uh, huge plastic walls to keep them protected from each other because, of course, we couldn't have A-list celebrities getting sick on our watch and we wanted them to perform and feel good. It's a feel-good show. And... Then with a drama, it was a BBC drama called Wurzel Gummidge with an A-list star called Mackenzie Crook, who was in the office, created the office, actually. We decided we were going to shoot it all out of doors, that we were going to put all of the stars and all of the team into bubbles. We took off all the handles from all the toilets because people couldn't be sharing and touching handles. Every time we did a shot, we would then clear the set wash everything down, sanitize everything, and then reset and do another take. I mean, it was laborious. But you know what? Both of those shows were able to go ahead and we did not at any time get a single person sick and we had no shutdowns and we delivered those shows. We were the first out of the gate with both. Now, how did that, how, how did that come about? Well, one, my team knew that we had their back because we demonstrated from the get-go that their health and safety came first. Two, everybody knew that our intention was to get back to work, but we couldn't get back to work unless we kept everybody safe. And then people rolled up their sleeves and they came up with these very, very detailed plans and executed. And you talk in, in, uh, earlier in our conversation about fierce resolve. Once you've made up your plan and agreed as a team what you're going to do, you have to follow it through with fierce resolve. There's no going back. And that's what my team did. And yes, we started at the beginning hour by hour, then week by week. Then we got into production. We produced these two shows. And then we came out the other side about nine months, I guess, after the first lockdown. And my team, I think, felt probably closer than ever. We felt like we'd done something extraordinary. And we'd been putting food on the table because we were earning. And we were back into production. And actually... On the back of that, I decided to write this book. We very willingly shared our COVID protocols with whoever wanted to listen because, um, you know, we are an integrated industry. And I actually found on the back of COVID that people became much more collaborative. There was incredible support out there and we were willing to share our findings as well. 
this actually gives me a perfect segue to something I wanted to discuss with you, James, because I think a lot of times when we talk about crisis, the typical focus tends to be, what do we do in those early days? And not so much a focus of what we're supposed to do when we're in the thick of it. And that's one of the things I appreciate about your flexible method is that you not only focus on, okay, well, here's what you need to do when a crisis hits, but then how you have to pivot to when you're deep into the crisis and you have to navigate these turbulent and uncertain waters. And you touched on one of these elements you have to do at this point. And it's the strategy you share that during times of crisis, leaders should look outside their organization's walls to find opportunities to collaborate with others in their industry. And I like this approach because it really emphasizes an abundant mindset over a scarcity one. Let's be honest, when faced with a crisis, there is a natural tendency to think there is a scarcity of resources, whether that's in terms of money, in terms of personnel, or even in terms of raw materials. So can you explain, James, how not only why collaborating with your peers is beneficial during a crisis, but how do we overcome our natural tendency to want to hunker down and keep things close to our chest? Yeah, hunkering down is absolutely a natural human instinct. And in a crisis, completely the wrong thing to do. We discovered in the credit crunch and during other recessions and indeed in COVID, and we talk about many of these different crises in the book, we discovered that in crisis, it is a strength to accept and to acknowledge and indeed admit that you've got problems, that things are not going right, that you need help. That is not a sign of weakness. It's the opposite. It's the sign of strength. And what is remarkable is that there are many, many people out there who will be willing to help you, whether it's peers in in your industry. And we had incredible meetings and get togethers. And I got to know people who work in the creative sector in a far more profound and meaningful way, frankly, during COVID than ever. People who who run museums and people who run um, cinema chains and people who run um, orchestras. You know, I met these people all over the planet who are willing to share their expertise and their findings. Also, I have to say that although all all of our governments made mistakes, they did also do some really excellent things, such as providing financing, or in the UK, providing furlough, in order to help us be able to look after some of our people and keep them in work. And again, one thing that I, I discovered, and I talk about this in the book, is that there is a bit of an ego thing, I think, sometimes with Um, especially entrepreneurs who think, you know what, if I kind of ask for help or admit that something is going a bit awry, then perhaps I'm not up to scratch. Perhaps I shouldn't really be in my job. And I I met this, uh, I interviewed him in the book. He's called Ed Templeton, a very smart entrepreneur, runs a a series of very interesting uh, restaurants, um, uh, mostly around the UK, but also sometimes he does pop-ups in the US. And fairly early on, he said, look, you know, hospitality is is a nightmare. We, we've got we've been completely shut down he'd recently invested hundreds of thousands in a new venue in central london had a baby on the way i mean you know it could not have been worse or more difficult for him and he said you know what i really don't know what to do i'm scratching my head because how can i keep my people who are brilliant and i trust and i value when i've got no income and i said to him well first of all you do realize that fellow is available the government has made money available in order in order for you to pay your people a certain amount of money to keep them in work yeah, but should I really reach out? Yeah, absolutely you should. It's there for the taking. You must do it. That's what governments are there for. The primary role of, a, of any government is to keep its people safe. And we needed to be kept safe at that time. And then separately, and Ed did this completely off his own back, he was like, well, I've got to diversify. I've got to think of different things. Of course, like many clever hosp- um, uh, restaurant people, he started providing food for hospitals. He was doing a hell of a lot of uh, cooking for doctors and nurses who are absolutely frazzled working, you know, all the hours that God sends. And he, you know, he he creates a whole new business, actually, catering for the medical profession, which they were so grateful for. He also started doing clever things like offering um, home homemaker cocktail kits that he could send around in a bike or home dinner dinner party kits for you and your partner to have at home if you didn't want to go, uh, uh, you know, come up with your own ideas. You wanted something that you would have got at a restaurant previously in your own home. And, you know, by cobbling together a whole mixture of um, uh, of uh, coping mechanisms, if you like, he was able to come through. And I'm really happy to say he now has two babies and his restaurants are doing really well. 
You know, James, I'm glad you brought up Ed's story because it reflects something I noticed as I was reading about your organization's own struggles with the restrictions brought forth in those early days of the pandemic. And that was how ready and willing your team was to adapt to these changing conditions. And this is another key element of the flexible method, which is being adaptable. Now, if I look at how many organizations are addressing the ongoing uncertainty about the global economy, I can't say I see a lot of adaptability going on. In fact, in many cases, I see the opposite, which is organizations desperately trying to return back to a pre-pandemic approach to work. So I'd love it if you could share here some lessons on how we can become more adaptable to meet external changes while still holding true to your organization's values and what you're hoping to achieve. I think it's interesting, actually, that the independent production sector, although you'd think, well, why on earth would a TV producer be qualified to give any kind of advice about crisis management? It seems like an unusual combination. But actually, the truth of it is the independent production sector is incredibly fleet of foot. We have we have um, um, flexibility and the, the capacity to pivot built into our DNA. I will give you an example about flexing um, and um, pivoting. In the credit crunch, uh, all advertising revenue collapsed. And we sell a lot of shows to commercial channels. And when they have no advertising, they have no money to buy our shows. So again, we were faced with an existential threat of no business. So what we did is we thought, okay, so who in the marketplace does have money? Now, the BBC has a guaranteed income, uh, which is government funding. And there is a part of the BBC called CBBC, which is Kids BBC, which is um, legislated for to provide quality television for children. Now, my group have been a bit snobby about making Kids TV up until this point. This is in Credit Crunch, 2008-9. But actually, we thought, you know what? Well, we produce programmes and kids need to be entertained. And we know the BBC has funding. So how about we give it a shot? So I actually said to my scripted team, look, okay, think outside the box. Why don't we go after CBBC and see if they'll commission a drama from us? So my drama team set some time aside, and that did require us to take a risk. It felt a little bit scary, but you have to speculate to accumulate. They came up with three ideas, which they went into the BBC to pitch, and all of them were were rejected. (laughs) So that wasn't a good start, but hey, it happens all the time. Then they went back to the drawing board. This is several weeks. Uh, and came up with a new idea, which is uh, um, about a, um, an artificial intelligence young girl who wakes up one day in the middle of suburban UK and um, in, in a family. Um, and it turned into a hugely successful, long-running franchise. Now, arguably on the back of that, not only did we win awards for that show because it's a terrific show, arguably on the back of that, it led to us producing later on the family drama Wurzel Gummidge, which is about a magical scarecrow, and indeed The Masked Singer, which is this huge family entertainment show on Saturday night. So there was a halo effect about us producing these very high quality CBBC shows, which, you know, previously we might have been a bit snobby about. And, but, but the crisis made us think, you know what, let's, let's open our eyes, let's broaden our horizon and let's see who else is out there. And it, you know, it absolutely um, re- benefits. I think you've set us up perfectly to talk about the next element of the flexible method that I wanted to discuss with you, James. And that is when you're in the middle of that crisis, you need to supercharge your creativity. Now, as someone who works in the entertainment industry, I think many of our listeners will see it as a given that your team and you are naturally creative. So for those who might not see themselves as being creative, what advice do you have for them for how to use a crisis as an opportunity for them to tap into their collective creativity to find a better path forward, to kind of, in what you just shared in your story, find those new paths, those new opportunities that you might have not considered and then realize over time becomes this new avenue for you to grow and achieve success. Okay, well, for starters, I think everybody has the capacity to be creative. We just have to be given permission and we have to give ourselves permission. So I'm a big advocate for calling meetings where we've got the receptionist and we've got the cleaner and we've got the top executive producers pitching in ideas because we're all experts in television, for example. We all watch thousands and thousands of hours of it. So why wouldn't some of us have amazing outside the box ideas, even if we are the receptionist in a TV company or indeed work somewhere else? So I do think there are 
untapped hidden potential in our teams. So I would absolutely first up go to my team and, and go, you know what? Who's got a crazy idea? Who's got a big idea? Let's create some blue sky uh, situations where people are free to test their ideas. And it's okay if some of the ideas are, are crap. I mean, listen, we all have good ideas and we all have terrible ideas. That's okay. That's part of the creative process. For every 10 ideas that are terrible, you get one really good one. So um, I think empowering your team to be able to um, test ideas and make mistakes, and that's okay. You're not going to get penalized for it. It's like that one didn't work, so let's move on. Then I think it's really important that you allow yourself to look at your competitors, look at what other people are doing, and scan the horizons for opportunities that you hadn't thought of previously. And there will always be people out there who are coming up with clever ideas, whether it's now with AI or whether it's people who are uh, doing everything remotely. Uh, for example, we have a, a major uh, TV talent called David Attenborough, um, who um, perhaps you know from many natural history programs. Uh, we wanted to produce programs with him, but he's in his 90s and it was impossible to get him out onto location to um, uh, to shoot because he would have not been able to be uh, insured. So what we decided to do is we decided to help him shoot all of his links remotely from his house in Richmond in, in the suburbs of London. And he absolutely loves the studio that we created for him and is now able to produce and, and host shows all over the world doing it from his own home. The last part of your flexible method addresses something that I think many of us don't put much thought into. And that is, what do we do when we ride out the storm and end up on the other side? In most cases, when we hit those calmer waters, there's a desire to get back to normal, where we go back to doing what we were doing before the crisis. But as part of your flexible method, you challenge that assumption and point out that there's something much more powerful and growth oriented that we should be doing, which I imagine will also help us be more resilient and capable of addressing the next crisis that comes our way. So when we get through that crisis, James, what are some of the things we should be doing instead of trying to get back to that so-called normal? I think the first thing to do is to get your team together. First of all, thank them for their incredible hard work um, and encourage them to rest. And then review how you did things. What did you do well and what did you do badly? And what can you do better next time? Because, of course, no one is perfect and we all make mistakes. But there are some things that emerge from crises which are incredibly valuable. And you can learn that from within your own organization. And you can also, again, scan the horizons. Who is out there who's in our space, who's done something really remarkable that we could pick up and maybe do ourselves in the future? It's very important to be willing to evolve. Going back is never an option. You know, the past is the past and the past is dead. Um, and we can learn from the past. And history is important. I love learning from history. but. One of my favorite expressions is the beginning is always today. We must look forwards. So by thinking that a crisis is now over so we can just kind of sit back on our um, haunches and just be you know, happy that we got through and then go back to how things were in the past. Well, that's, I'm sorry, that is there, thereby lies um, extinction. We have to keep evolving and keep changing and, and, and constantly have an open mind. And to be honest, I find that really exciting because I love the way the world is evolving. I love, as I've mentioned this earlier, the way AI is now coming into our world. I do think that humans and AI can absolutely coexist and we can use AI as an amazing creative tool for the future. And one thing we're going to have to do as human beings, because we are able to think both with our head and our heart, is we're going to have to evolve and develop in the next generation a more finely tuned sense of emotional intelligence so that we can manage AI and manage it sensibly and responsibly. And therefore, it becomes a magnificent tool for us to be able to grow. Well, James, I thoroughly enjoyed reading your book because I think the harder lessons your team and you learned are instructive for the rest of us for what we should be doing when faced with a crisis and of how we can successfully navigate our team and organization through those challenges and uncertainties so that we can get through them to the other side stronger, more resilient, and more committed to our shared purpose than we were before. So thanks, James, for coming on my show to share your story and your lessons for how we can all do a better job leading our team and organization through a crisis. Thank you for your great questions. I've really enjoyed being here with you. If you'd like to learn more about James and his book, 
Check out the show notes for this episode on our podcast page at tavernaseer.com slash LBC. And if you're interested in learning more about my speaking work, please check out my speaking page on my website, where you can learn more about the topics I share in my keynotes and corporate training sessions, as well as what leaders and attendants have had to say about the insights and ideas I shared at these events. I'm Tavin Desir, and you've been listening to Leadership Biz Cafe.